Graham, I don't know what happened here, but all when I was talking with the audience, all of them said you should grow a handlebar mustache. Uh, <laughs> that was established while you what? were away. Oh, yeah. uh, I think we need to have a GoFundMe then. Because <laughs> I, I got to tell you, I have a. You want to talk about a government secret, Lee? I have a long, rich history of never having facial hair. I try. I grew a beard once. Really? For the commercial. And, uh, I thought, cause I've had, I've been shaving since I was like 13. I'm like, Oh, I'm going to grow this really thick beard. You know, I'm dark. It's, it's going to be, I'll grow this in like a week. And in t after two weeks, I just had this scraggly <laughs> weird beard. And I was like, this is horrible. Like I should, I should never. Well, most well, 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 mine is no, like uh, mine's not one of those massive, like Irish fucking, you know, <laughs> Li living in the woods beard so my my i wouldn't call mine impressive it just does the job <laughs> an irish living in the woods beard um i think it's all pronounced in one word irish living in the woods beard <laughs> yeah yeah an irish living in the woods beard which i gotta tell you was the name of my doctoral thesis and um i <laughs> I tried to defend it, and that's why I don't have a PhD because they wouldn't. It made no sense. An Irish living in the woods beard. Um, yeah. Yep, yep. Well, uh, do, so do, so do do we know the problem? It seems to happen every week now. Uh, <laughs> why why you can't hear me? Uh, I think it's a different problem each week. Oh, that's okay, good, good. It's exciting. Well, you know, um, as long as we can. I've always said my goal in life is to fail differently every time. <laughs> Fuck up in a new and exciting way every week. For all you young viewers out there, <laughs> fail differently. Find a different way to fail. Um, I know, I'm sure you were wondering, Lee, as was our audience, what's in my smoothie? Of, co of course. Or better yet, who's in your smoothie? Well, an Irish woodsman beard I ground up. Um, <laughs> um, it's got, um, I tried unsweetened cashew milk this time. That sounds different. like the most boring thing I've ever heard. That that sounds like a review of a John Tesh album. Just like the, listening to this sounds like it, it feels like drinking unsweetened cashew milk. <laughs> oh shit! I think I hurt Graham. Uh, uh oh, folks. <laughs> <laughs> oh god john tesh of smoothies it really is unsolicited. <laughs> oh no i really i really oh, hurt graham <laughs> well Lee, john tesh is an american treasure and um <laughs> This is the part where uh, you you tell me. Well, I, I've worked with him a lot. He's actually my uncle, and I'm like, oh fuck, ah oh, shit. He gave me my start in show business, Lee, and uh, he's like, Graham, this is how you become like unsweetened cashew milk. <laughs> <laughs> Holy shit! <laughs> can, can, can you actually taste unsweetened cashew milk? I feel like that's that's not what, really. Yeah, yeah. you can't. I mean, the only thing made giving this thing flavor is the fruit I put in it. You know what I mean? But I think the, I think the fruit's doing the heavy lifting, definitely, without a doubt. Yeah. It's like John Tesh's backup singers or band or whatever. They're they're the actual musicians that are carrying this guy. <laughs> they are the wind beneath his wings. You know what I mean? They're. I. Uh, so I think we should definitely spend our first five minutes on establishing whether you uh, have succeeded in your quest against your car insurance company or whether there's now three car insurance reps buried in your backyard or uh, what stage that is at. I, right. know, they, 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 I know the fans want to know. They want to know what happened. Government secrets, car insurance update. <laughs> <laughs> um yes breaking news i've heard nothing from the insurance company <laughs> nothing nothing has happened this guy called me monday before the holiday 
a week ago and said, um, looks like uh, your car's probably going to be total. The repairs are going to cost more than the total. Um, but your car's still sort of drivable. Who, Some who would have would have thought a car called a leaf could be so easily totaled? <laughs> I would have thought it would have been indestructible. The 2017 Nissan Leaf, the John <laughs> Tesh of, of, of automobiles. <laughs> the, the, the unsweetened <laughs> cashew milk of cars. That's that's how they described it when they introed it at, 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 at Truckamania or whatever. Monster, Truck monster Mania. truck. Monster truck of mania. And coming now, the cashew milk of cars, the unsweetened cashew milk of cars. Bum, 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 bum. Ladies and gentlemen, Liz Shelley, Big Daddy Don Garlich and his wheels of steel, Truckazaurus Rex, and the unsweetened cashew milk of automobiles. <laughs> the 2017 Nissan Leaf, 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 Leaf. Um, <laughs> it is. I feel, God, this thing. So I've been driving this rental car now for over a week. And this, I feel so guilty to say this. And I'm half tempted to not say it, but it's just too funny. So my rental car is a Nissan Rogue. And I like it better than my Leaf. I hate, <laughs> I hate to say that. I feel like a vegetarian that had a steak for the first time in 15 years. And was like, <laughs> Yeah, this is great. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, shit, man. They're really cooking these up a storm now. This is great, man. Like, I, I was vegetarian for years, and then I ate one live chicken. Just bit its head off, and I haven't turned back since. <laughs> it was the capturing it and eating it live while it squirmed, which was really the turn on for me. So, um, and look, this is my second electric car. I had a. Uh, Kia Soul EV. It had it had a three year lease and it was up this summer, and then I got this Nissan, and I got to tell you, my Kia Soul. I loved that car. That car was amazing, and the Leaf was all right. Um, and we now know it's the unsweetened cashew milk of automobiles. Um, <laughs> I just I love the difference in the names. It's like the ones that are the trucks that are going for the fucking. Hillbillies in North Dakota are named like Tundra and fucking Elk Cock, you know, like, and meanwhile, Graham has owned a leaf and a soul. It's a leaf and a soul. The and, Chevy uh, Namaste. And, 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 and he also once had a, 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 a Honda Gossamer Teardrops <laughs> that, he, that he drove into the horizon. The Toyota Chakra Crystal <laughs> that runs on rainbow fumes and unicorn whispers. It's what powers it. Or you can you can have the Chevy Gunstake, which is <laughs> an amazing vehicle. So back to um, Insurance Gate uh, car. <laughs> so the guy said, um, uh, and I was going to get another knee. I got to go back to the, the Kia Soul <laughs> because the Kia Soul EV, the 2021s were supposed to come out this summer. And my, my 2017 Kia Soul EV, all electric, had like about 100 miles to the charge. And the 2021s were going to have 240 miles to the charge, which was like, well, that's it. That solves all the problems of living in Southern California because with 200 some yards, I can go to see, I can go all, all over the place. And there's fast charge. There's a great infrastructure of charging in California, right? <clears throat> so they stopped. They when the pandemic hit, they stopped making like all the car companies were like, we're not making cars anymore, um, or we're going to slow down production. And so the the Kia was like, I, I don't know if we're coming up with another year with this. I don't know what we're going to do with this, right? And you know, you know, I, I moved and I got the the Leaf. So anyway, and the Leaf was fine. I like having an electric car. So anyway, the leaf, you know, a tire hit it and it crumbled. <laughs> so <laughs> for for most cars, what would have been a fender bender uh, turned yours actually 2D. Your car is 2D now. Uh, the, it lost the third dimension in the wreck. And, it, uh, I should honestly put photos up because they're pretty. <laughs> it's amazing. Uh, 
I I can so that we don't uh, so that people don't tune in thinking I I thought I was going to get government secrets and there are no government secrets. I can give uh, we, we there's some good government secrets about uh, about car charging that we could throw in here. Uh, we could get into um, well, for one thing, we could get into uh, who killed the electric car. Right. Uh, we could get into the fact that many cities in America had a actually great functioning uh, electric trolley system before that was destroyed by big oil and big automobiles. Los Angeles being one of them. Los Angeles had yep. an amazing public transportation system full of trolleys. And one of the tire companies and the oil, I think Standard Oil went around and bought them all up and scrapped them. So that's a little gov seek. Bought the actual bought the actual trolleys? Yes. And scrapped wow. them. And told Americans to buy cars. You know, it's almost I mean, correct me if I'm wrong here, but it's almost like in a capitalist society, uh, money is power. <laughs> it's almost like that. Uh, I don't know, Lee. I think it's hard to, mm, I can't put, quite put my finger on it. I mean, it, I don't know if that's what capitalism is and or um, the needs and the will of the people to form a really functional society are like number 25 on the list. <laughs> behind i want to make as much money as possible so i can have my own boat or yacht or island or plane so, so you're saying functioning society is on the list that's exciting that's exciting <laughs> oh yes there you go that's that that'll nothing gets a centrist more excited than there's a chance <laughs> um but also uh i grew up in richmond virginia and it's funny because Richmond, Virginia is, you know, especially when I was there. Now it's becoming a little artsy, a little more interesting. But when I was there, uh, it was still good old South, a lot of a lot of hillbillies running around. And there was no sign of any electric infrastructure, no electric cars. No, The, the Hummer became quite popular when I was in high school. Um, and I found out Richmond, Virginia, the fucking first city to have a functioning electric trolley. Like the first ever test and functioning electric trolley. And I, I don't, I know that big oil and big automobile crushed it and took it, you know, there's no remnants of it. But I, when I read that, I was like, no fucking way, you know, back, back in, well, it was, you know, a hundred years ago or something, but it's just, it's incredible that these infrastructures, these, it, it was actually like, Hey, let's progress society. And big oil and big automobile were like, whoa, whoa, whoa there. What's that going to do for my bank account? It's so maddening to think what America and the world could look like if we stayed on the track of like, hey, let's progress society. What? Let, let's make things better. Let's oh, we were doing things the old way. We've learned a new system. What's better for all of us? Like, what's better for all? Oh, hey, slavery's awful. Let's end that. Let's build an infrastructure. Let's have clean energy. Let's have all this stuff. Like, you hear, I mean, we could do, I mean, we could do a whole, another uh, automobile gov secret is the diesel engine was created by Adolf Diesel in the 30s to run on vegetable oil. Really? Oh well, yeah, it was, it was, and he designed it for farmers. He was German, obviously. Um, and then, I don't know, something happened to the name Adolf became not popular anymore. I, 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 I don't remember. I, 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 yeah, I think it was, so, uh, I think someone performed really poorly in Eurovision and he was named Adolf. And, uh, ever since then, <laughs> Yeah, no German one can name. Talent. There was a guy that named Adolf that didn't do well, or I can't remember what it was. Can't um, quite remember. I mean, I, I think it was the death knell for my uh, for my uh, neo Nazi sketch group that it was called Adolf <laughs> more than you can do. <laughs> Adolf for the wicked too. <laughs> oh God! Callback. Oh, I love a good gov seek riff callback. Government secret riff callback. <laughs> <laughs> Um, the, the last thing, I don't, I don't know if we're getting ready to move on, but the last thing uh, that the, the last kind of uh, government secret I can throw in here is there was like two years ago or something or three years ago. It was back when Elon Musk was not tweeting every insane fucking uh, awful thought that came into his skull and instead was viewed as like just a guy helping the planet. And uh, and a hurricane was approaching Florida. I think it was like three years ago. 
And a hurricane was approaching in Florida, and there was a, a, a scramble for everybody to get out of town, and gas, uh, ga gas stations had lines for hours and things like that. And they, uh, Tesla elongated the battery life in all of the Teslas in Florida so that people could get out. And that was a lovely thing to do, but it made everyone realize, hold on, you're telling us the battery actually artificially empties? Like it uh. says it's dead when it's not dead and you can push a button at Tesla headquarters and elongate the, the life of our battery? That's fucking crazy. But of course it makes sense because they want them to buy the longer battery life, the more advanced cars, et cetera. And so it's like your iPhone, you know, artificially dying. What, boy, I know. What a simpler time when we thought Elon Musk, and I was one of these, be like, oh, the Tesla and he's making solar panels and oh, he's doing all this great stuff. And it's just like, oh no, he's just an evil, soulless, bag of shit capitalist like all the rest of those hoodie wearing maggots in Silicon Valley. Um, yeah, uh, he's, he's found a way to basically make a lot of money from the fact that people now care about climate change. Yeah. And still, again, like he could go, we could put 400 miles a range in all of our cars, but we won't except when there's a crisis. And then that fake, uh, that other fake, like, isn't he cool? No, he's not cool. Bill Gates isn't cool. Zuckerberg. They're all fucking assholes. Right. And they need to crumble like a leaf getting hit by a tire. Anyway, we'll wrap up this government segment. By <laughs> <laughs> so they said they're probably going to give me the total tag on my car. And um, which means, uh, yeah, they're going to have to, because I put some money down on it and I got an extended warranty. I can get a refund on most of my extended warranty because they prorated apparently. And then what they're going to do Cause he's like, some people, if your car's still drivable, my car's still kind of drivable. He's like, some people keep it. And then we just deduct the cost. And I was like, and I've driven it twice. I'm like, this car is not safe at all. <laughs> like it is going to. What does kind of still drivable mean? You can turn it on. You can drive <laughs> it. Please. You're moving it like the Flintstones, the feet through the bottom. <laughs> yeah. Yes. You just take out the floorboards and do that. <laughs> But no, it drives, but it just doesn't sound great. And yeah, it makes a lot of weird, like I can drive it in traffic. It's still legal. The lights work. It turns on, but I'm it's like- It's still legal. That should be your, your, your decider as to whether you're cool with this car. It's still legal in some states. It's, quite, it's sort of, on some roads, it's kind of legal. So I feel <laughs> safe. Um, so I'm like, I said to this guy last week, I go, dude, I just scrapped the thing. And I said, what's the process? He goes, if we get that, we got to hear back from the appraiser. When that happens, we'll literally just give you a check and you, we take the car and you'd sign the title over to us. But I'm like, all right, I, I had to finance some of it. So I have to, I'm just hoping they don't come back insurance company style and go, yeah, here's a check for nine bucks, you know, good luck. And it's like, oh. Right, right. You might want to ask them how much this check is for. Yeah, they haven't come back with a price yet. So this was the Monday before Thanksgiving. It was like, we'll probably call you. <laughs> They're like, will you get a vintage pair of swimming trunks? <laughs> You're like, thanks. <laughs> they give you a vintage pair of swimming trunks. <laughs> like with the one piece with the stripes on it. And they're like, oh. this, hang on to this. This is great. It'll appreciate value. Um, <laughs> what if they were like dumb the other way and were like, well, we're only going to pay you in these things called Bitcoin. I don't know what they're worth. But there's a hundred of them. Like, good. Yeah, sorry. It didn't work out. That'd be um, amazing. Just, just once you get the, the insurance once. company that's, that's dumb in the wrong direction. Yes. They're like, so it's only nine Bitcoin. I don't know what that's worth. Uh, yeah, it's probably worth like six grand or something. That's cool. I'll just take no worries, man. You know, you tried. <laughs> just be like, later, bitch. <laughs> just <look. laughs> I'm gonna buy 10 Nissan Leafs that can explode. I, we, we, listen, it. it's not much, but it's just these uh three original Fabergé eggs. And uh, we don't know, but you you could probably get something for them down at the flea market. I don't know. Is at uh, this 
action comics number one is that <laughs> worth anything i don't know just take it you know it's got um, a super guy on the front kids like the super guys so Bobby Root Teeth, Ruth or something, ba Baby Ruth or something. I don't know. It's a baseball with this guy's name <laughs> on it. I don't know. Just have fun. So that's where we're at. I'm and they didn't. I, I was like, they're not going to get this shit squared away before Thanksgiving. So I'm gonna. I've just been driving around in my rental car. You know, nope, living the dream. Living the dream. <laughs> so that's that one, and that is. I will cut this. I think it was technically a gov seek because we put in there the. Ripping yeah. up of the trolley system and Adolf Diesel's car in there. Listen, listen, I'm counting it. I'm fucking counting it. I don't care what anybody says. Government Secrets, episode 18, first segment. <laughs> um, folks, this is Government Secrets with Lee Camp and Graham Elwood. Please uh, download it, give it positive reviews, like it on iTunes and Spotify, share it on your social media. If you're watching it on either one of our YouTube channels, hit the like button, subscribe to our channels. If you're a fan of one of ours, but new to the other guy. Um, so do all those things with government secrets, ladies and gentlemen. Cause uh, I don't mean to brag, but we are bigger than ever before. And uh, yeah, you should, you should, you should tell your friends that you were one of the early adopters. Yes. All right. Cause that, that'll get you a social credit. Yeah. You'll be like, I listened, I listened back in the day before they I've been listening to, since episode 13 <laughs> or 14 they didn't know which number it was that's how far back I go yeah but they did they refused to keep track back when they did that all right Lee so what's what's your first what's your first gov seek uh I was going to get into um because a lot of people a lot of people don't realize like well so I'll start by saying a lot of people that, that view this know that you and I have had uh, an impressive amount of uh, suppression and censorship on what we do. Um, there is, I don't mean to, uh, to uh, reveal anything uh, crazy here, but there's a reason I've never been on the tonight show. Um, what? <laughs> so performers have this, and I think we've talked about this before uh, this first part that Performers have a kind of a wall up for what they talk about, a glass ceiling. And if they go beyond it in terms of questioning the corporate state, uh, talking about things that are not allowed on CNN, then you 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 can still achieve some success. I'm not saying you and I aren't successful, but it's often the kind of quasi nether reaches of the YouTubes. Uh, it's not uh, on NBC uh, at you know prime time, and and. That goes uh, with a lot of performers from the past as well. Now, almost all of them, without exception, became famous before they started pushing the limits. And then when they started pushing the limits, it was too much for corporate media to allow, for the corporate state to allow, for all of the, the these people, the, the, the CIA, the FBI. Uh, it, it, it was starting to get threatening to the kind of unfettered capitalist structure that runs our country. And, uh, you know, there are some very obvious examples uh, that, that you can point to where it's like very clear. For example, the Smothers Brothers, uh, hugely famous, had a hugely successful TV show. Uh, uh, I believe it was one or two seasons. I think it was maybe the end of the second season. Um, and this is a time when there's like three TV channels. So having a huge TV show is millions of people watching uh, it's not like now where you're like i'm on channel 912 and we have a total of seven viewers which is 70 percent higher than most tv channels uh this is yeah, half of america is watching this mother's brothers yeah you, and I mean, they became more and more anti-vietnam war um i can't remember which one but uh but one of them was even maybe tommy was uh was very adamant and uh as they started speaking out more and more against the Vietnam War, uh, this hugely su successful show is just pulled off the air because it didn't matter that they were getting endless views, that people loved it. It was questioning the the U.S. state and uh, and what we're doing around the world, and that was too much. Um, but kind of a more uh, squishy example where you can't be like, "Wow, that's so clear what happened there." Uh, the two big, huge ones that, uh, you know, I, I think people need to know about is, you know, Jim Morrison and Lenny Bruce. 
And both of them are more extreme because they end up in the death of the performer as opposed to the Smothers Brothers just get canceled. But uh, they, they really, I mean, yes, they both OD'd on drugs, but both of them were kind of driven to their deaths or at least driven out of the main, for Jim Morrison, who was driven out of the mainstream, uh, which, you know, then he OD'd. Uh, but with Lenny Bruce, it was really driven to his death because he lost all ability to make an income. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, for anybody who doesn't know about, uh, most people know Jim Morrison and the Doors pretty well. Not everyone knows uh, the history of Lenny Bruce, but Lenny Bruce, hugely successful comedian, but got, got successful on kind of uh, PC, we'll call it, although that term didn't exist then, kind of nice uh, uh, humor that was allowed on late night TV and uh, got famous from that and was touring around and became more and more edgy, started going after uh, the religious institutions, which back then you couldn't question, um, started saying uh, 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 words, naughty words that are not allowed on the stage. And they started arresting him repeatedly for speech, for the things he was saying on the stage. And it was, it basically, the, the, the whole system uh, decided that he was too threatening. I mean, a, a comedian going on stage and questioning our, our, our systems, our state, our religious uh, institutions was too threatening. It, it, it couldn't be allowed. And so they started arresting him uh, regularly at his performances. And uh, I don't, I don't want to keep blabbering. I can let you uh, go jump in here. <laughs> well, no, that's that, you, you bring up a lot of great points, which is, which is, uh, first of all, one of the reasons why we've talked about this before, but comedians like you, me, you know, Jimmy Dore, uh, you know, Ron Placone, whatever, why we're not on network TV, why we're not on the tonight. <laughs> by, the, by the way, you listed those as if there's a whole long list I won't get into here. No, that's it. You covered that's it. it. <laughs> <laughs> those four people, these <laughs> five of us, um, like, um, uh, because I obviously to me, like the ruling class learned from the 60s and 70s. So just to give a little in, into this government secret, to give people a little history lesson. So Hollywood was run by the studio system um, uh, uh, through the through the mid mid to late 60s. And then the studio system started to collapse. And if you read, there's a great book to read, Easy Writers Raging, Raging Bulls, where the 70s was this amazing era in Hollywood where you had movies <clears throat> like uh, Apocalypse Now, you had The Godfather, you had movies that really show, like Apocalypse Now really questioned. Yeah. You had The Deer Hunter that was like, war's awful. Um, and then Hollywood got bought up by the big corporations in the 80s. So, and that's why there are almost no, and today <clears throat> with all these streaming services and all these options, you cannot find, you cannot find anything that truly questions the CIA, the American military industrial complex. You've got shit like Jack Ryan. It's like, isn't the CIA cool? And I bring that up because they realize with shows like the Smothers Brothers and the Smothers Brothers started calling out the Vietnam War. So that's when Laugh-In started. They put Laugh-In out there to be the giggly soda pop version of the Smothers Brothers. It's a sketch variety show with no teeth in it. Right. No social commentary, just dancing and, hoo -hoo 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 and bikinis and nonsense. And while the Smothers Brothers, they they ended up throttling. And, and the same thing with Lenny Bruce. He was questioning things. Um, and it wasn't that he was swearing because there was people like Buddy Hackett who were the most foul mouth comics ever, but they were foul mouths on, you know, uh, in the Catskills and in the late night blue shows, yeah. they didn't challenge any societal norms. They didn't challenge organized religion. Like, I mean, Lenny Bruce would, I remember I, I watched uh, a documentary on him. Plus I remember watching as a, as like a young, I was like a 12 years old when they, when video stores started, I went and watched, uh, the Dustin Hoffman Lenny movie, which is really powerful. Yep. And he talked about cops arresting him 
because he was calling out the Catholic church and the cops literally like had like the Ash Wednesday thing on their forehead. Like these Catholic cops were like, uh, uh, you don't get to question that. And that's why they just kept arresting him because he, he was, was he was also, I think uh, a lot of it, some of the stuff had to do with, with calling out systemic racism, although he didn't use the term systemic racism, but. Well, yeah, his his philosophy, and you can you can agree with this or disagree with this, was I'm going to say the N word over and over so it has no more power anymore. Um, and he would he would make jokes that made people uncomfortable. There's a there's a there's a one time there's a uh, when he was like at his at his height in like the late '60s, he was performing in New York City, and everyone was like, "You got to come see this guy." And so uh, Wilt Chamberlain, who was at the height of his fame and celebrity and winning championships came to see him and um and uh i think will chait was like smoking a cigarette or maybe even you know a, a, a joint or whatever and lenny's like oh shit can i get it can i get a hit of that and in the show and i was like oh this is so cool lenny's so edgy you know performers never do this and lenny said oh man you <laughs> you n-word lipped it which was like a, an old racist term. And he said it and everyone kind of got uncomfortable and laughed. And then he talked about in this very brilliant way about why that word was so uncomfortable and what it meant and why, and, and his, uh, his philosophy, and you can say this is effective or not, was to blow that to, sh to, sh to show how awful systemic racism was. And yeah. It and, and it probably was, you know, this doesn't excuse it, but, Times have changed a little bit, uh, and the, the you know this probably was the same time that D Dick Gregory, who obviously is black, so there's a huge difference there. But uh, his, I think it was his first book, maybe was was just titled uh, the N word, uh, not not the N word, but the N word, uh, and uh, <laughs> and and it was and it was meant to. I mean, the reason he titled it that was kind of to force white people to deal with it. Um, and I'm sure Lenny Bruce was heavily influenced by that kind of thing going on. Yeah. And it was this time of challenging and questioning everything. I mean, Richard Pryor had, had several al comedy albums that had that in the title. And so he was making people uncomfortable. White, white America was really uncomfortable during that time as well. A lot of them should have been. And as well, um, white America is uncomfortable today. I mean, with the George Floyd and the black lives matter and white people really having to like, look at their, question their white privilege and like, man. Um, and Lenny Bruce was doing that and got arrested for it. And you see then as we look to what media is like today, I mean, we, I remember when Ron and I were out in DC and we were on redacted tonight, we talked about how we were all just, and you, you said to Ron and I, like, before we started shooting, you, you were like, you guys are only like the third or fourth comics or fifth comics I've ever had on this show because there's no comics today that are talking about real political stuff. We were like, oh yeah, every comic has their three Trump jokes. Right. But they won't, they, they, even comics that I, I like sort of respect go on stage and are like, talk about how great Obama was. And we're just like, they yeah. And, and I think a, a lot of that's kind of a combination of, uh, 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 well, or I think a lot of it is probably ignorance just of the reality. You know, they, 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 they've centered their life around getting their news from CNN or NPR and they don't move past that. Um, but there's definitely a percentage that are smart enough to know, you know, I can really address these issues or I can be, uh, far more successful. <laughs> so well, you look at the Netflix specials today. Look at the comedy Netflix specials. It's always about some guy, oh, I'm a boozy partier. I'm a slutty girl that sleeps around. There's no one in there talking about anything real. Except yeah, and, well, and, that, and, that, and that's interesting to have seen how Netflix has also been locked down, as has most of the other, rest of the internet. When Netflix was younger, uh, one of their most viewed documentaries was they had the Zeitgeist films. Uh, by Peter Joseph, and and those were getting you know millions of views uh, on there and elsewhere. And nowadays, you could never picture Netflix like paying to acquire the Zeitgeist films. I mean, that would be far too edgy for them. Uh, Obama is one of their content creators oh. and or content uh, whatever he is producers now. Yeah, and then you're also seeing. So I, I, I the more I've been you know doing my show political vigilante and this show and, and paying more attention. I'm now really watching <clears throat> the, 
the messaging they're giving us. And you go, you, you go on any of the, any of the streaming platforms, Hulu, Amazon prime, HBO, Netflix, whatever. And it's like revenge, really ultra violent. Isn't America great. And be a slacker. Like be a, isn't being a slack. That was the comedies are all like, Oh, these right. dip slackers because they saw the power back in the sixties and seventies, they saw the power of the smother brothers and the power of Lenny Bruce to like get people united together. And they can't, they can't have that. They have yeah. to have us divided and distracted and afraid and fighting with each other. That's why, you know, you know, um, what is it? The social experiment. They talk about at the very end of it. Like we're all put in these silos designed to get us into civil war. I mean, like these revenge stories and like so brutal and so violent and there's no, and they celebrate, oh, isn't, oh, there's all this stuff with Obama now on everything. Is it, wasn't he great? And now that Biden won, oh, yay, ding dong, the witch is dead. You know, we have had no racism right. war prior to Trump and now it'll all be over again. And they, and it, it goes back to these, and now they, they, I mean, like the CIA has script approval on like big Marvel movies and stuff like that. And you see, well, the, yeah. And, I think we, we we got into some before, but any any movie where you see any kind of large military equipment, uh, unless it looks full CGI and it's some alien spacecraft, but uh, if it's a you know even uh, up armored Humvees and those kind of things, like that means that the military and the CIA had script approval because the only way a movie studio gets to use that shit is to go to the CIA and say, we want to make this. And it, they've gotten more sophisticated. It used to be even up through probably a lot of the nineties that you would see these kind of full propaganda movies where it's like the military's so great and they're killing this evil terrorist bad guy. But now it's, it's far more sophisticated. They realize that you see a movie that may have a lot of moral qualms in it, qualms in it, and like, uh, you know, who's the good guy, who's the bad guy. But there's just kind of a hint of like, well, the CIA is mostly doing good. The CIA did some bad, but really it was to help America. Like, it's not as cut and dry. So a lot of people walk out of these movies not thinking, wow, I just saw some propaganda. They walk out thinking like, oh, that was a you know nuanced take on the CIA. But they know what the fuck they're doing. They, they've realized oh, yeah. that the propaganda full on just like CIA, yeah, wasn't going to last. And so they've moved on to a far more sophisticated uh, uh, Hollywood. Well, this, the, the sophistication like you're talking about is very – it's always, you know, do the ends justify the means? Yes, is always the answer to that question. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That question does the CIA's ends? I don't know. We're breaking a lot of laws, and is it moral? But the end is the right before the credits roll. You know what? Yeah, it was worth it. And 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 it's fucking unbelievable. And, and it's always a guy trying to come to terms with it. Be like, man, I don't know what we did over there. And then his friend's like, listen, we couldn't have done anything else. <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> the end, America. Fuck yeah. Like, it's just. There's this great. Actually, I'll loop this all together back to Biden. Although I do want to say something else about Jim Morrison in a minute. But uh, the, the back to Biden, the guy he just hired for or whatever, picked for some uh position uh, a cia i'm sorry i don't have the name with me but uh a cia former cia guy uh there's an interview with him that uh, that it, it, the, the clip is just a minute and a half long but his interview with him talking about his time at the cia and he's talking about trying to convince a student who who walked up to him at a job fair and said you're with the cia they do awful stuff and he was like he was like yeah but we do it to protect america or something like that and then the student goes, uh, the student goes, well, what, what's the, the number one thing you're looking for in a, a candidate to work for you? And the guy goes, integrity. And the student goes, integrity? But you guys proudly say you lie, cheat, and steal. And this is Joe Biden's new pick for uh, a posi whatever position. Uh, he, he goes, he says to the student, yeah, we do, but never to each other and only to help America. Oh, no. 
That's so sweet. That the, the number one thing the CIA looks for is integrity. Ah! <laughs> I love that. That's just like that's just like the drug dealer. That's like, hey, I'm not going to sell in my own neighborhood. Right, oh, right, right. You're so sweet. Like, it's like the it's it's like the murderer who's like, listen, we have a code of conduct amongst him, uh, hitman. All right, hitman. We don't we don't get in each other's way. All right, we respect each other. It's so that like, I love the people that do awful shit, but then have this ridiculous realization that some, and, and, and they sell it to you and people, some people are, are naive enough to go, oh, it's like, hey man, like Ted Bundy, he murdered those women. It was awful, but he didn't eat them like Jeffrey Dahmer. Like he's not a monster. Like, no, oh, no, no. yeah. That's, that's that's he, had, he had a code of conduct. All right. Yeah. <laughs> He had integrity. I mean, he had, there's certain lines you don't cross when you're bashing women's heads in and killing right. them. You don't, crawl, you don't eat them. Like, hey, oh. you know what I liked? He always dressed well, all right? It, it was about, <laughs> it's about integrity. He dressed well, dignity. He, <laughs> was, he, he had his shirts ironed. There was some class to it. He had a, was a clean cut young guy, wasn't a filthy hippie. I mean, yeah, he was a mass murderer that was a horrific and he lied to everybody, but he wasn't, he wasn't horrible. <laughs> Like, it wasn't horrible like Charles Manson. You're like, he killed like 30 more people than Charles Manson. It's like, yeah, but Charles Manson's shirts weren't ironed. <laughs> yes. It's okay. Like, oh, so if Ted Bundy had a swastika carved into the middle of his head, then, then <laughs> you'd be scared of him. But right now, because he's good looking, it's all right. Oh, and that mentality that I think going back full circle to all this is by design. The CIA, as you've pointed out, has gotten way more sophisticated Versus just blatant propaganda. People might be too wise to blatant propaganda. So they've realized, and I'm sure they've studied this, you know, and tortured people to get this information, whatever evil shit they've done to go, wow, this is how we water it down. And part of, part of that is lesser yeah. of two evils. Getting people, how much can I keep pushing these people? How much crap will they take if I just hide it just enough? It's like the... The people dancing in the streets for Joe Biden. They're, and for the next four years, all we're going to hear is, well, at least he's better than Trump. You know, I had somebody say that a, a neoliberal comedian said that to me. Well, I mean, Obama was at least better than Bush. And I was like, not if you lived in Yemen, Syria, or <laughs> Libya. he wasn't. And they're like, ah, they just because. So the CIA is like, oh, see, look, we can sell people on this lesser of two evilism, which means we're just keep moving the line on how much evil we can get away with. <laughs> Right, right, right. Oh, I can so, push these people further and further, and then right, right, right now Nixon would be viewed as a left-wing Democrat. Yeah. Oh, I know, absolutely. Oh hell, those pie in the sky Nixon things. Oh boy, like. Um. Uh, anyway. Uh, Jim Morrison. Yeah. No. Yeah, Jim Morrison. Uh. So. Uh, some people might not know the the. They know about Jim Morrison. They know the Doors. Uh, they know they were edgy, you know, even even in their time. But they might not know that, like, towards the end there, I think I think most of it occurred in his final year. Um, and, you know, fi final year, the dude was like 27, uh, 26 probably. Uh, but they, uh, they went to perform, and they were becoming – they were becoming dangerous in a variety of ways. I mean, he uh, – through his behavior and somewhat through his songs, he was promoting uh, drug culture. He was promoting uh, uh, he was it was anti-war stuff. He was promoting uh, kind of free love, uh, you know, the, the the stuff that went against these church traditions of you you marry someone and then the two of you only fuck each other forever, um, and and this type of thing. And he was becoming very powerful. It's not that there weren't other bands saying this stuff, other musicians, other artists, but it, it has to do with the level you get at. Uh, another one would be John Lennon. Um, but it has to do with the level you get at combined with what you're saying. So the doors had gotten to be uh, to the level of like the American Beatles and they're playing these massive concerts and they have songs that are, you know, the unknown soldier and, and, and songs that are anti Vietnam and the things he's saying between the songs are uh, controversial for the for the corporate state, uh, and so they and, and they you know they've they arrested them multiple times, uh, at least twice, um, following shows. But the one that they 
go forward and continue to prosecute him for is a show, I believe in Florida, where uh, where they claim he, he unzipped his pants and took his cock out. Right. And there's actually no, you know, this, this concert was incredibly photographed. There's photographs of every second of it. And there's no photograph of him with his dick out. Uh, there's a photo of him pretending as if he's taken out his dick. And anyway, they, they pushed this trial through in Florida. Uh, I, th- I believe it was in Florida. And uh, he's facing, you know, years in prison or, you know, maybe even, j- j- maybe even just a year, but it, it, it's very, you know, anybody facing that kind of shit. And I'm not going to act like Jim Morrison had his life together. I mean, this was, <laughs> this guy was completely fucked up. Uh, you know, drank, uh, chugged vodka as he rolled over in the morning. Uh, so it's not like he had his shit together, but he wasn't doing anything that deserved prison time. And the, the stress of all of this, you know, he goes away to France to get away from it. Uh, he balloons up and becomes uh, much larger than ever before. And, you know, he's drinking from morning to night and he's uh, doing drugs, but it seems quite, uh, you know, d- doing uh, uh, hard drugs. And it, it seems quite kind of, it, it's, it's not a far, a far cry from what happened to Lenny Bruce, which is they put immense stress on these people who already have immense stress because they're massive celebrities. And they put the stress of the state going against them. And people who are already using a lot of drugs and a lot of alcohol use more to deal with the stress. And uh, at least in the case of Lenny Bruce and Jim Morrison, uh, ultimately die from it. Um, so, it, you know, it, it, there, there's a lot of similarities there uh, as to how they became threatening and what they were talking about. Well, yeah. And it, I think the other thing they learned too was like, boy, if we assassinate these people, they really become more martyrs and all these questions are asked whether right. if we badger these people and push them into a corner, eventually they'll, they'll OD, they'll drink yeah. themselves to death or OD like, like Lenny Bruce did with heroin. And you know, Jim Morrison, I think just drank himself to death and they're like, Oh, so then we can say, Oh boy, the addict yeah, couldn't deal with it. And, and then we're not saying like, Oh no, the state killed them because like, they learned so much from the Kennedy assassination of like, boy, too many people are asking too many questions. No right. way. We have to just crush them, crush their careers, push them aside, force them to, to self-destruct. That's the best way to do it, man. And, and it serves, it's a double-edged sword or whatever. And, uh, you know, it, it serves two purposes, uh, because not only are you probably pushing them closer to death if they're already addicts, uh, but you're, uh, you're, you're maligning their name as much as possible. You're trying to make sure that a Jim Morrison doesn't become a hero to the whole nation. He might be a hero to a subsect, but you know, they were so massive that he was becoming a hero to young people across the country. And if you can say, oh, no, he's taking his dick out on stage, he's yep. uh, doing all these awful things, uh, then you can, you know, uh, at least uh, tamp that down, if not ultimately cause his death. But Yeah, and that's what they did. And that's part of that whole, that's why media today, even with all these options, is just pushing the capitalists and the war machine and the American exceptionalism. They're just, they push that. And that's why your show, my show get throttled. I mean, like I've, I've lost a thousand subscribers in the last month. I, I do, I go live four to five days a week. I drop between 15 to 20 clips a week, three, usually three clips a day. And you're really going to tell me that my subscriber count on YouTube has gone down. Yeah. Like, it's not, it's not possible putting out that much content. It's just impossible. And yet they keep doing it and they're trying. Yeah, to- I, I, I get the same. And by the way, these, these tech platforms definitely speak to each other and speak about practices that are working for them. And uh, I've had exactly the same thing. And I, I mean, my YouTube is basically stagnant, but uh, so there, I don't think they're letting it grow, but the most obvious one is my Facebook, which uh, when Trump got elected had 335,000 followers and I was gaining uh, you know, between four and 6,000 a, a week. And uh, it just stopped. And it's only gone down ever since. 
Um, and so it just slowly trickles down and now they have it down even below 330,000. Uh, but you're telling me that, you know, I'll have posts that get, you know, I'll put up a, a meme or something that does well and gets a few thousand shares. And you're telling me I somehow lose subscribers while I have a very popular post out there. Um, and it was kind of the, the funniest one was I had my first thing go by. I, they must've changed the algorithm or took the, th the, the throttle off or something. I had my first thing go viral in four years. I put up a meme of Jeff Bezos about how much money he makes. And it gets 80,000 shares seen by millions. And so I guess the number of people following my page must have beat whatever it is they have that keeps it down. Because all of a sudden I jumped back. I gained enough followers that I basically jumped back to where I was four years ago. And yet then they sped up the decrease so that now... What, what it took me four years to lose as they were slowly suppressing things, I've now lost in like a matter of weeks. It's unreal, man. Like literally a month ago, I was at 73,700, like on my way to 74, 75,000. And now I'm at 72,700, 800. I, yeah. I mean and, and back when these things were not uh, tamped down, I I would never, de you, you just don't ever decrease Unless no, you were to do a video no. completely antithetical to everything you stand for, you know, you might have slower growth, but these things back when they were allowed to grow were always growing. I mean, always. it's just natural. No, yeah. Especially if you were posting content consistently, it would just keep growing. That's the, that's the, mo and the, you, you can't tell me, oh, our analytics, we're having a, no, you guys are doing this intentionally. You can't, I can't, I don't buy you know, I talked to this Google rep a couple months ago and I don't think he's nefarious. I think he's a decent guy and he's trying to do his best job. And he's like, oh, we get, you know, a million, something like a million hours of content uploaded every minute or something, whatever. I mean, I get it. But so we have to use robots now more or computers because of the pandemic and blah, blah, blah. And I'm just like, uh-huh, dude, I, I'm sure he believes what he's saying because that's what he's told. But somewhere high up, they're flipping a switch. Well, and fucking wall. I mean, <laughs> well, so I actually did speak to I, I can't say who because uh, he doesn't want it to get out there that he know that, you know, he he has contacts and knows this. But uh, he has friends at the uh, at least one or two friends that are really a, kind of close to top echelon of Facebook. And uh, they told him they were like, dude, it is a it is the Wild West. He's they're, they're like, we can do whatever the fuck we want. And no one asks any questions. If we want to shadow ban someone so that they never gain followers again. He's like, we we do shit like that all the time. Uh, it's just it, there, there is no there is no higher governing body at Facebook. That's like, wait a second. Don't mess with that guy's page. He's worked very hard on it. Could you imagine Zuckerberg in a meeting being like, some of these people worked hard on these pages. Don't hurt them. They worked hard and they actually generate revenue for this company. So we need to protect their audience. And respect and protect their First Amendment rights. No, 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 no. Well, I don't trust Google as far as I can throw them because they've been working with the CIA since 2011. Um, uh, which something I covered on a recent show. I don't know if you saw this news story. It snuck through the cracks. Uh, you know how the CIA and it has a deal with Amazon for $600 billion? Uh -huh. So they recently announced their latest cloud computing software deals multiple billions they're get they, they, they don't know the number but probably 20 billion dollars and they spread the contracts amongst amazon google ibm oracle and uh i think one other but so so basically we now know that the entirety of the big tech uh you know uh fucking uh world is in debt to the cia to the tune of billions of dollars Shocking. I'm <laughs> shocking that, 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 that's the world we live in. Lee, I think everybody's pretty honest and fair. All right. So we want to, we want to move on to one more, one or two. Yeah, more. yeah. Let's do one more. I know we started late, so we did start a little late, but let's, um, all right. Government secret segment number three. Beep, 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 be
why not? Well, I just, I mean, we were talking about Biden's cabinet, but let's, let's, um, real quick, that guy Blinken, uh, his stepfather has ties to Jillian Maxwell. Anyway, so it's, uh, <laughs> I didn't, I didn't know that. Yeah, no, uh, Biden's, uh, cabinet so far is garbage. I mean, it's, uh, it's near a tandem. It's, uh, uh, Floor Noy, who's, uh, I mean, these are all people who have been full on part of the war complex, uh, promoting and endorsing all wars done by democratic presidents, uh, since going back to Bill Clinton, there's, not a one of them has been like the Iraq war was wrong or the, or the Afghanistan, bring the troops home. None of them like unreal oil lobby people. I mean, it's unbelievable. Heidi high camp. I mean, horrible. Like, and so this guy Blinken, his stepfather was a Holocaust survivor. And there's this very amazing story. He got rescued by, uh, African-American U S soldiers. And it was like, Oh, wow. I mean, like, that's, that's pretty, well, that's an amazing story. And isn't, isn't that how one of the things that's great about, uh, America, a, a guy who's descendant of slavery was now freeing people from Hitler's tyranny in the Holocaust. Okay, great. Um, but he was friends with Robert Maxwell, Jalene Maxwell's father, who was also in Mossad. Come on. Uh, and, and Robert Maxwell was, he wasn't old. He was kind of viewed as like royalty in Israel, but it was, he was also very high up in the, the social echelon in uh, Britain as well. Right? Yes. So the British Royal family, of course, that we know has ties with Prince Andrew to, to Jalene Maxwell and Epstein, also, the British royal family. There's a whole nother story. Jimmy Seville was a was a TV personality that was uncovered was a was a pedophile, and he was helping. Well, yeah, long time pedophile. But people need people need to realize that if they if they haven't been to Britain, Jimmy Seville is not like a a small name. This is a guy who for 30 years basically owned British television. I mean, he was one of the main. He's like Larry King or something. One of the yeah. main faces of British television. Yeah, he was a huge, like everybody knew who he was, like Johnny Carson or something at Carson's, you know, in the 70s and 80s, like Carson's like fame, like he was the guy back again, like you were talking about earlier when there was only two or three channels. And so if you had a hit show on one of those channels, you had, you know, 30 to 40 percent of the whole country watching you. Yeah. Um. So there's all these ties like that. And then. um. So. That's just, I just wanted to throw that just a quick, so, so good people. You're saying good people, yeah, solid people. Um, and I, um, I've always, I, I said when Trump got into office and he was picking his cabinet, I used to talk about how I don't know, like, where he's finding these fucking creatures to be in his cabinet. I think he flips over rotting logs, and that's mainly where he finds most of his cabinet. Well, Biden is now flipping over the like the 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 maggots and the bugs underneath that and that's where he's finding his cabinet members. Yeah, so you're the larva underneath the <laughs> maggot. You uh, you know you know when a tick starts uh, sucking on the blood of like a roach that's you. You <laughs> you're the diseased cockroach tick blood <laughs> which as i know you can tell everyone one of my favorite metal bands <laughs> i'm not a metal guy but that one album they did i'm <laughs> i i love it um so i mean it put you on test of shame it really did <laughs> God, wouldn't it be great if his cabinet was actually unsweetened cashew milk? Like, just don't <laughs> tell her. They're not evil. They're just, you know, <laughs> municipal workers are just like, all right. <laughs> fine, yeah. you know. Wouldn't it be great if the worst complaint you could have for Joe, Joe Biden's cabinet was like, this guy's kind of not done anything in his life. Like, he was just the guy who, like, stamps the papers at the, like, <laughs> yes. fucking garbage depot. And you're like, he, he's never done anything important. And everybody would be like, that's great. That's Let's so much that. better than what he could be. Oh, this person just ran the libraries. Perfect. 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 That's all. Don't, I don't need him to do more than that. Just, just hold on. Um, 
So yeah, that's who Blinken is. Uh, real quick, that's his stepfather has ties to Robert Maxwell. He uh, his stepfather was basically one of the last people to talk to Robert Maxwell before before he mysteriously slipped and fell off of his boat in 1991. Um, okay. You know when Masad everybody falls off the boats. Okay, everybody. just just like rich people, their planes often spontaneously explode in the sky. Uh, just ask John F. Kennedy Jr. <laughs> Yes, it's totally plausible. People get despondent and hang themselves with paper t-shirts. It's totally, <laughs> it's real. It's something we should all believe. Um, so that's just a real, another glimpse. And this guy Blinken is, is being tapped for his, the state department. Great. So Exxon Mobil was running the state department under Trump and now a global pedophile ring will be running it under Biden. So it's really, it's exciting times. Um, and uh, the, the guy that Biden has selected to run his U S agency of global media transition. So this is basically the guy that is in charge of all media for the Biden transition is named Richard Stingle. And uh, there's a lovely clip of him online saying, you know, when I was at the State Department, he go, he, he, in this, he's in a panel in front of an audience. He says, when I was at the State Department, they called me the chief propagandist. And, you know, we haven't talked uh, uh, right now much about propaganda, but I'm not opposed to propaganda. I think it's a good thing. I think that our government should use more propaganda on our people. Uh, I, I, I think it's a very good thing to have that. And, uh, yeah, that's the guy. L literally... Oh. You can watch video of him saying the government should lie to you to fill your heads with bullshit so that they can continue their raping and pillaging. That's my boy, Dickie Stingle. Come <laughs> on you know, dude, Dickie Stingle, I thought was only what happened to me when I walked through the woods that time. But, uh, you know, it was I went off the path and it was a bad idea. I should have I should have stuck with the path because no. Uh, if you're, if you don't want to get a Dickie Stingle, don't stay on the path, stay on the path of righteousness. So, um, yeah, I mean, I think it's obvious our audience knows you and I are both very much pro government propaganda. That's the whole purpose of the show. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> we really want people to know it's okay. A little propaganda is not bad. Um, well, you know, at the end of every government secrets episode, we say, uh, don't tell anyone else about the stuff we talked about. <laughs> Keep it under, keep this under your hat. Keep it under wraps. Keep, keep this episode, just keep it on the DL. If you know what I'm talking about, keep, give it a little dicky stingle. You know what I'm saying? Um, <laughs> so that's a little side, just a little, well, I'm sure every week we're just going to be, we'll have a little section on how horrible Biden's cabinet is going to be. Right. Right. Um, but, uh, I wanted to talk about the federal reserve, um, because, so the United States has- Hold on, there's, there's no secrets there, are there? No, no, no. This is just like, a, oh, okay. look at the work they're doing. It's really okay. good work. It's like, cool. it's, it's just a history lesson. Like- Good, good day. Th they were started the same time the Girl Scouts were. It's good stuff. Um, <laughs> just real quick, the federal- they, they actually, most federal, most of the Fed's money comes from uh, uh, those coconut cookies. <laughs> they, um, what do they call The Samoan cookies? Yeah. Yeah, those are great. Yeah. If somehow the CIA or the Federal Reserve or the military could figure out how to get a taste of Girl Scout cookie money. You know, they would. They're like, you know, <laughs> they would. You know, they would. Um, which is why, like, literally Raytheon is working with the Girl Scouts. Whole nother side thing. Um, <laughs> but uh, so the Federal Reserve, just so people know, we have printed more money since the pandemic. than the United States has has printed in its entirety. Um, really? Yes. yes. Uh, which don't, that's not, doesn't mean the dollar is going to be collapsing at all. Don't worry about it. It's totally good. That's good for the economy. Just print, print, print. Um, and let me, let me just, let me just add in here. When you say print, you really mean created out of out fucking of thin air. Thin air. Yes. Uh, most money is 90 some percent. I think it's closer to 98% or something is never printed. It's, right an idea in a computer somewhere uh, uh, ones and zeros somewhere say that someone has this imaginary wealth that does not exist and never existed and is not even because i think a lot of people think that printed money is is what really matters but we don't even print most of it so really it is it is truly nothingness it is it is beyond just the meaningless pieces of paper it's just an idea 
So uh, yeah, it's it's like when people are like oh Bitcoin, it's digital money. What the hell is that? I'm like, that's what we all operate on right now. Do you have the dollars in your bank account? No, you get direct right. deposit from your job. You use your card to pay it. You pay everything digitally, or maybe you write a check, which again is just digitally moving money from here or there. Um, and since we came off the gold standard in 1971, we've been operating on fiat currency. So even fiat currency is only a real, is a 49 year old experiment. So the fact that people are like, ah, Bitcoin's a lot of hooey, like, well, so is fiat currency, but let's get to the history. Very true. And I just want to say gold currency, completely different because it's shiny. It's shiny and pretty. Um, yeah. But back then, like before 1971, a, a United States dollar would say a gold treasury note. So like whatever the amount was, let's say we had a trillion dollars in gold at Fort Knox, that's how many dot bills we had in circulation. So it was backed up by the value of gold. So we don't have that anymore. So the right. So, so this meant back back then there was a limit to the amount you could create. There was because there's yeah. a limit to the amount of gold out there. Now, granted, gold is meaningless too. It's just a shiny rock, but at least it meant that. There's only a certain amount. Yes. Which is, again, this isn't a segment about Bitcoin, but why people are calling Bitcoin the new gold, digital gold. They've only, there's only 21 billion Bitcoins in circulation right now. And every, and they mint new ones every day, but every seven years they have it. They cut it back. So they're keeping it like gold. There's only a certain amount of gold on the planet. You can't make gold in a lab or whatever. So, um, but I bring this up because the Federal Reserve in 1907, there was the San Francisco earthquake, 06, 07, somewhere in there. And when that happened, the economies collapsed and there was a run on the bank. So we've heard that term before. And that's when people, uh, the economy goes bad and people would go to the bank. And this this happened in Greece and recently in the last 10, 20 years, it'll, it might happen here very shortly where people go to the banks and the banks, of course, loan out more money than they've got in cash reserves, right? Let's say a bank. And so back now they're doing it in crazy amounts. That's what created one of the reasons they created the last housing crash in 2008. A bank would have, let's say, uh, you know, a, a hundred million dollars in phys physical cash reserves and they would loan out, you know, a billion dollars Right. So, so yeah, the, 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 the term that, and it's one of the most harmful things is fractional reserve banking, meaning the, the bank has one tenth, usually that's, I think the norm, one tenth of what they're actually giving out, uh, in actual reserve. So if everyone goes there demanding that the, their money, not only do they not have enough, they don't have anywhere near enough. They have one tenth of what is out there uh actually on reserve yes so then when people get panicked because of some calamity or whatever then they go to the bank saying i want my cash out and that's what's called a run on the bank so this happened after the earthquake and this i i was watching some history about the federal reserve this had kept happening in the 1800s several times in the 1800s there was run on banks and uh jp morgan chase the actual man was like, well, this isn't good. And he was basically running the world from his study in, in Manhattan. <laughs> but, he, but he was a good guy. He really just wanted to help people. I think. All those guys are good. Rockefeller, solid guys. Good. Well, and, and, and if you look up at their Wikipedia, I guarantee you the first word next to their name is philanthropist. Yes. That they paid to have in front of their name when it should say just murderer. <laughs> right. It's right. like... So he was like, well, this is people keep running on the banks. This isn't good. Um, and slowly or he kept having his thing basically. So then in 1913, the federal reserve is created because they had a secret meeting and most people, I, I thought this for a long time. Oh, the federal reserve is like, it's the bank of the government. It's Congress backs this. No, it's just a bunch of ba individual bankers were, were told we need to be able to loan banks money to backstop them basically when there's these runs right. so we're getting this these other bankers involved and then we'll just do this and then now we can do this with the federal government and so the federal reserve is just basically a bunch of bankers it's a banking cartel <laughs> it's yep. 
it's it's and it's it's come and it's a central bank and nobody wanted a central bank back then that's why they called it oh, we'll call it the federal reserve so it was basically just a marketing ploy because people back then in the late 1800s early 1900s didn't want a centralized bank right that's what they created so that they could then do what they want with their money and back in the government woodrow wilson signed it into law in 1913 and and the, the banks that make up the federal reserve are are uh, private banks now they i don't know the the numbers uh i you know i used to know them but uh, i haven't looked them up recently but there's a certain billions of dollars that the federal reserve basically makes from you know interest or whatever else and most of that is given back to the us government uh, but a percentage is kept by these banks. So it's whatever it is, five or 10% or whatever. So these private banks make like five to $10 billion. And I might have those numbers wrong, but I know it's somewhere in that realm. Uh, maybe it's up to 20, but they make billions of dollars simply by creating out of thin air, the U S government's money, the U America's money. Uh, and so the idea that you've got these people making billions of dollars just on the creation of our money is like fucking ridiculous. It's so preposterous. So when you look at something like the CARES Act that had buried in it $4.25 trillion to Wall Street, what, what you're saying, to clarify for our audience, is then the Federal Reserve created this money and then kept a little taste. <laughs> they get a little, yeah. they yeah. Get a little big. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, well, yeah, I got to get, get a little taste for myself. Yeah, of course. Well, something just to, for, for the effort. You know what I mean? I'm not greedy. Just a little something. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, I just got to make sure it's good stuff, you know? <laughs> yeah, I can I can re create money for you out of thin air, but I got to I got to create a little something. I mean, just for my time, for my trouble. Oh, <laughs> for my, for my trouble. Um, and so, something else that is incredibly important when you talk about the Federal Reserve or the creation of money is that for every dollar that is created, that you owe a certain amount of uh, interest to pay before it's paid back. Money is created when it's loaned out. So in the moment it's loaned out, it comes into existence. Uh, and that's then owed back plus 5%, let's say 5% interest. So that means that for every dollar that's created, instantly a dollar five is owed. Meaning there is never the amount in circulation that is actually owed back. If all the money were paid back uh, uh, immediately, there wouldn't be enough money. Like, And that's why you see debt spiraling out of control in all of these capitalist countries, because it is impossible to actually pay back what is loaned out. Man, is this a great system. Like it really feels <laughs> like it's, it's sustainable forever. And it's not, it doesn't, Cause when you, when you really break it down and learn about it, it's not, it's not like you're sitting here going, Oh, we're weeks, months away, maybe even weeks away from just a complete global collapse worse than anything we've ever seen ever. Like, yeah. And, and even, even if you just look at the regular boom bust cycle, not even some collapse, the likes of which we've never lived through. Even if you just look at the normal boom bust cycle of capitalism, you know, the average is four to seven years of each recession, each bust. And for a lot of people in America or in whatever country that might not have that much import, um, there's a lot of rich people that don't suffer it really at all. Uh, there's a lot of middle class that do okay. But for every bust, there are millions that have their life, lives destroyed. Destroyed. I mean, with the mortgage crisis, you have millions of people kicked out of their homes. And of course, when someone's kicked out of their home, uh, you often have a spiral of suicides, of divorces, of uh, obviously then that fucks up uh, the children. Uh, and, and it's just the, the ramifications of this system are kind of just fucking never even... I, I mean, they're hardly talked about the fact that every few years, the system just destroys millions of people and the rich get richer. And that is how the system is meant to work. That's when it's working right. <laughs> yeah. 
That's like, oh, everything's working great. Oh, great. Domestic violence is up. Suicide's up. Petty crime's up. Oh, this is fantastic. This really works. Just people are decimated. Then you've got generational, intergenerational abuse. You know, like, because because yeah. somebody, I mean, like, I, I always tell people who are like, oh, capitalism, the free market can fix. But I go, I go, you name a societal ill, name one, and I'll tie it to capitalism. Name one. Pick one. <laughs> Drug addiction. Oh, wow. Probably because they were abused as a kid. Why were they abused as a kid? Maybe their dad or mom were having money trouble. I bet you somewhere in there, there's a lot of reasons for child abuse. There's a lot of reasons for it. But I right. bet you somewhere in there, somebody lost a job. Somebody foreclosed on a thing. Somebody, Something happened in there that really put a catalyst on that. And they were like, well, why were, there, why were your parents uh, abusive. Well, they were children of the depression. So they, I mean, like I can trace it back. I can yeah. trace it back in my own family or anybody's family. Like I can trace it back to that. And we're, we're on, I mean, I, I got divorced in 2011 and there was a lot of reasons for that. And some of it was stuff I had to work on myself. My ex-wife, we're still friends and that's great. But a big you can't overlook the fact that I went through bankruptcy and foreclosure. That was a huge, constant money stress, like constant man, yeah. constant. And it was like, oh, and it was thanks to Bush and mainly Obama letting the banks steal my fucking house. I made some mistakes along the way. There's no two ways about it, but I wasn't bailed out. The, the banks make mistakes. They're so fucking, they're fine. So, so yeah, I mean, I, 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 people obviously know we're friends, but I don't know uh, all that about your uh, everything about your history. But your, when you say you made some mistakes, was this kind of the thing where that you were talked into signing something that was kind of unsustainable? <laughs> uh, yeah, I was definitely offered like, oh, this will be easy. I was like, are you sure? Yeah, no problem. And it's like, those were some of the mistakes, and those, I mean, I put. Some right, which is, but some not. Some it's like, well, no, no, yeah, it, it, yeah. I, I mean, look, it, it, in any decision we make in life, people are going to say, well, some of it's on you, and it's like, okay, yeah, some of it's on me. But the, the, the like that process was designed that way. Yeah. It wasn't like, oh, everyone. We it wasn't like they thought people understood how these. Uh, subprime mortgages or or variable rate mortgages or all this crazy shit. Oh, people understand how it works. And then they were like, oh my goodness, they don't get it. Uh, it but the fucking system was designed to push things on people that they couldn't quite grasp because we're not fucking mathematicians. We're not economists. We don't know legalese. And, and we're not it, taught like, it. We're deliberately not taught any of these things in public schools too. That's part of it too, to keep us ignorant. So we'll just sign whatever and go into debt and get a credit card or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's like, it, it, this was, this worked the way it was supposed to work. It was supposed to trick people into things that they likely couldn't afford. And, you know, some would afford it and the bank be like, all right, great. You can afford it. But, uh, I mean, it, it was a, it's a fucking horror show system. And yeah, some of a very slight bit of that has changed, but most of it's still going. No, it's all, I mean, watch the movie, the big short. I just watched it again. Like I tell people, watch the movie, the big short, because it's all going to happen again. They say it at the end of that movie, nothing got changed. Yeah. I mean, and, and the, the, and they started back in 2015, these, these basically same bullshit loans again these QDCs or whatever they were called, you know what I mean? Like they're, they're bundling these, these bad loans together again and, and putting a nice wrap around them and saying, Oh, they're great. It's all yeah. happening again. I mean, you were talking to uh, all of us, indie media people were all talking before the recession about the housing bubble, the commercial real estate bubble, the student loan bubble, the, the, the car loan bubble, you know, there yep. was in February, I, I did a story that there was, uh, 2 million car loans that were 90 days late or more in February. You think that number's gone down now? So like, <laughs> it's like, and now getting back to this topic of the federal reserve, it's part of the whole system that was designed to where wall street and the federal government can just give themselves. They got, they got great socialism. Those folks, they get amazing socialism. Everything's paid for. Everything's taken care of. We saw it in the cares act. 
We'll see it again. I mean, Biden's going to come to the rescue and sign some stimulus. Some new stimulus needs to be signed. Yes, it does for the American people. But guaranteed buried in there will be more kickbacks to these Wall Street assholes. And also, I'll just throw this out. If I'm not mistaken, correct me if I'm wrong, every president that said they wanted to end the Federal Reserve got assassinated. That I don't know. I'm just going to say yes. I know that JFK said he was going to end the CIA. And that went well. That that didn't help. Yeah, he said it's going to end the CIA. A lot of people have like, yeah, we need to get rid of the Federal Reserve. And it's just like a lot of, that's a whole other government secret. Oh, anyway, do, you, do, you, do you have that list on hand? How many of them said they were going to end the Fed? That's a great question. I don't have that on hand. <laughs> it wouldn't be great if the answer was like, ah, it turns out none of them. None of them. <laughs> not, none of them said they were going to end the Fed. Nobody said they were going to end the um, But... Uh, yeah, I think it's kind of it's kind of might be tied to like all the 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 leaders of that of the world that said we're not using the petrodollar anymore, and then we invaded them or they got murdered. Right. Or, yeah, or it's, it's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the the central bankers rule all at the end of the day. Yeah. yeah, and they that's one of the things they need. Going back to what you're talking about with the debt, that's why they love war so much. Is war. Gives everybody puts every, every country has to print money and go into debt to to keep a war going. I mean, they have to do that. That's why back. Um, so the Federal Reserve also lies that they that that deflation is bad. No, it's not. Deflation is actually the cost of things cost less. So like in 1865, after the end of the Civil War, um, to the 1900. Uh, by the time you got to 1900, I believe or maybe it was 1880 or 1890, somewhere in there, you could buy, the cost of goods came down after the Civil War because there was a lot of inflation. After there was a, You have to go into, both sides had to go into debt, right, for the Civil War. So that's the thing they talk, they always say, oh, deflation's bad because, oh, that'll hurt wages. And then, and I watched this video, this guy said, so like after the Civil War, all these wages went up and the cost of goods came down. This is before the creation of the Federal Reserve. <laughs> so like, that's another thing the Federal Reserve lies to us about is like, well, inflation, we need, it's part of, we need it. No, it's only good for, you don't, we don't need this. We don't have, that, things don't have to cost more. Like, right. And, and speaking of only good for them, uh, a lot of people, including Trump, are very excited that the Dow hit 30,000 or whatever. Uh, and meanwhile, that means nothing for your average American. Uh, first of all, 80% 80, 80 of all stocks are owned by 10% of people. So they're not getting money from these stocks going up, most Americans. But then on top of that, uh, corporations, generally their stock does better when workers are fully exploited, meaning they don't have any power. They don't have, they, they can't yeah. stand up and fight back. The corporation does better. So you see a high stock when uh, the average American working person is uh, fucking, you know, crumpling under the stress of it all. Uh, that's when a stock does well because the corporations have full, full, full power to do whatever the fuck they want. Uh, my analogy that I've been using for years, but I, I wanted to catch on, is that being excited about the how well the stock market is doing is like uh, if you saw like a dying man in his last hours and you uh, judged the health of the leeches on his skin and you saw they were healthy. And so that means he's doing great. It's like, no, you're you're looking at the parasites. <laughs> The leech market is doing fantastic. <laughs> Leeches are going through the roof. But that's the other thing when people always say, oh, the stock market is when the, when the media says this bullshit. I'm always like, especially now, I'm like, weird. Be so when the stock market just, oh, the stock market just had a great week. Huh. You know who else had record numbers? Food banks. Yeah. They've had record numbers. Yeah. The, the past Thanksgiving week, record, all the food banks are like, I we haven't seen anything like this ever. I can't remember. Maybe you can help me out. Are food banks on the Dow Jones? I don't know. Do <laughs> um, I want to say no. I don't <laughs> think that they are. But yeah, someone's like, well, maybe we should put food bank stock on the market. Like, <laughs> It's unreal, man. It's unreal. So anyway, that's my Federal Reserve government secret. <laughs> 
Um, Thank you guys for uh, for joining us. I'm going to dip out and let uh, Graham answer some questions. But uh, yeah, everybody can check out my stuff at LeeCamp.com. And uh, I was mentioning when we had the sound issues before that I've just been told by PM Press that my book is 50% off right now with the coupon code uh, GIFT, G-I-F-T, uh, until uh, until January 1st. So that's you got to go to their website, though. Don't get it on Amazon. You got to go to pmpress.org and you can get 50% off. Uh, the book's called Bullet Points and Punchlines. Um, but yeah, other than that, yeah, I have a show called Redacted Tonight. I have another podcast called Common Censored. And uh, it's all at leecamp.com. Support small businesses, you guys. So go to pmpress.org. They're a cool little publishing house. They actually are out of San Francisco. They were at Ron and I's show, our last live show we did before the shutdown. And again, support them over, over Amazon. And Bullet Points and Punchlines is a fantastic book. Makes a great gift. Uh, Makes a great gift. A great gift for family and friends. Um, <laughs> and uh, also, you Did know, you have to uh, train for the, for the radio voice or is that just natural? You know, Lee, this was my standard speaking voice that I talked to the good people of America and across the world and all the shit to see. Um, I think my training was I grew up and, you know, as a kid in the 70s, when you stayed home from school, you'd watch game shows. So I just that was my training was faking that I was sick so I could stay home and watch Jim Perry jog out for card sharks or whatever. <laughs> Is it higher than a nine? Yes. And then you learn the is it higher than a nine? Ooh, <laughs> that's a skill. So it's a skill. So I'm yeah, going to doing a game show post training school. <laughs> People. Anyway, folks, uh, also you can watch my show, Political Vigilante on YouTube. Uh, and uh, we're, uh, Lee and I both are on rockfin.com. So check out that yeah. cryptocurrency platform. Uh, and of course you can get all my stuff at grahamelwood.com. That's it. Government secrets episode 18. Put it in the books. Later, man. Have a good day. All right, buddy. Thanks for watching everybody. Please hit the like button, the subscribe button, go to patreon.com slash grahamelwood and rockfin.com slash grahamelwood where you can support the show. Also, I have a Bitcoin wallet, a Bitcoin cash wallet, and an Ethereum wallet in the show notes. We're taking cryptocurrency. I have a Coinbase affiliation link. We're going to be getting on some other exchanges. So that's how you support the show. Make sure you hit the subscribe button. YouTube is unsubscribing us at an alarming rate. I have a PayPal button at GrahamElwood.com. I even have a Venmo at Graham-Elwood. There's a lot of ways to support our show. We are getting crushed by YouTube. They're unsubs we've dipped under 73,000 subscribers because of YouTube. Thanks for supporting what we do.